So this is lecture 32, um, which is still um, talking about the finite element technique. And uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more about what these uh, weighting functions look like, these interpolating functions, and uh, just uh, how we begin to understand them and, and how we'll eventually use them to put together the, the matrices and the, the, the vectors that we need for our finite element um, problem. So this is where we stopped uh, last time. You can see that our finite element problem is uh, is up here. It consist of, consists of, of n equations and n unknowns, which we've put into matrix form. Uh, you can see that uh, we have the, the C matrix, which is n by n, and it's related to a bunch of area integrals over the computational domain. Uh, the area integrals involve these weighting functions, these interpolating functions w, and then uh, the unknown vector is uh, the vector of these unknown temperatures t. Uh, same thing for the k matrix, again an area uh, integral uh, that involves all of our interpolating uh, functions, and then on the other side we have the g and the q vectors. So. Um, this is what W and T look like in general, and uh, our temperature then, which is a function of x, y, and time, is just uh, it's just W transpose times T. So it's W1 times T1, W2 times T2, and so on and so forth. So today we're going to talk more specifically about what W and what T are. So those area integrals have to be done over our computational domain. So just to remind you, this is what our computational domain looks like. Um, we're going to break our computational domain up into uh, triangular elements using a mesh that looks like this. So here we have uh, a bunch of nodes that are placed around the uh, around the computational domain, and those nodes are joined up to make triangles that, that become our elements. So uh, this particular mesh has ten nodes. So there's ten different specific locations uh, where I've placed a node. Um, this particular mesh has 11 elements, so there's 11 triangles that are formed to cover uh, the entire computational uh, domain. Each element is uh, triangular and therefore it's defined by three nodes. So in general we'll say that element E uh, must be defined by three nodes, I, J, and K. And that's kind of how we'll think about um, uh, discretizing this uh, computational domain. So with this in mind, let's go back to our approximate um, temperature uh, solution here. So T is um, you know the product of the weighting functions, the interpolating functions and the uh, and these these T functions. And T, so T1, T2 through Tn uh, in this vector T, those are just the temperatures at each of the n nodes that together make up the the mesh. So for our case, it would be the, the 10 different nodes that make up that mesh. Um, the interpolating functions then that are assigned to each of these t functions, so w1, w2, they basically tell you about the influence of the temperature of that node on other locations in the computational domain. So um, that's one way to think about it is that um, if you're right at the node obviously then the influence of the temperature at that node is really high and as you move away from that node the influence of the temperature of that node on the temperature in the computational domain should go down and we'll see that you know if you move more than sort of one element away from the node for at least these linear elements that we're going to deal with the influence goes to zero right so that's that's really the way to think about what these interpolating uh, functions are. So we're going to confine ourselves to linear elements and what that means is that the temperature inside of an element is a linear function of the temperature of the three nodes that uh, together define that element. So uh, visually that looks like uh, like what I've shown here. So um, you can see that for element IJK uh, inside of that element, the temperature is a plane, right? And that plane passes through uh, the Ti, Tj, and Tk. So you can think of this almost like a pane of glass that's being used to represent the temperature distribution everywhere uh, inside of that element, right? And um, if we 
uh, want to start doing these area integrals that we need, we have to start thinking then about what is the formula for the temperature uh, inside of a given element. Because we're going to do these integrals element by element. So the, the temperature inside of this element is, is designated by this T with the superscript E. And that's the temperature within element E. And the temperature within element E is a lot more, uh, is a lot simpler than the temperature uh, anywhere inside of the computational domain. So anywhere inside the computational domain we have you know all these different weighting functions, all these interpolating functions that could be active and all of the nodes might be important. We don't know which ones are and which ones aren't. But if we're inside of element E we know that only three of the interpolating functions are important and those are the three interpolating functions that correspond to the three nodes that together make up the element. So uh, inside of, of of element E, um, what this looks like is uh, zeros everywhere inside of this um, row vector, which is W transpose, except uh, in column I, in column J, in column K, those three interpolating functions would be non-zero. Right? And if I, if I do this multiplication, then this ends up being WI times TI plus WJ times TJ plus WK times TK. Right? All of the other um, W's are zero inside of this element. So what does this WI, WJ, and WK look like then inside of element E? So we know that if we're right at XI and YI, so right at the location of node I, we want to make sure that we get TI. Right? Our, our approximate function should equal TI and therefore at that location WI had better be 1 and uh, then wj and wk at that location need to both be zero and it's the same thing at the other node so if we're at location xj yj then we know wj better be one and the other two would better be zero and the same thing for for k so within element e now uh, we know wi is going to vary linearly between uh, one when it's at location uh, i and it's got to be zero when it's at J and K. And so that looks uh, as I've drawn it here. It looks like a, a pane of glass again. And in this case, you know, it's uh, zero along the line J, K. And then it approaches one as you move up towards um, node I. If I did the same thing for W, J, and W, K, they would look very similar, right? So W, uh, J is going to be zero at nodes uh, i and k and go to one at, at node j and wk is going to be zero at nodes uh, i and j and go to go to one at node k so we can start to think about what wi looks like over the entire computational domain then it's going to be one right at node i and it's going to be non-zero only in those elements surrounding node i. So in this case, these six elements, it'll be non-zero. And so you can start to think about it uh, as maybe uh, a pyramid like this that's centered on node i and then extends to zero in the surrounding elements. And of course, all the other weighting functions would look like this as well, little pyramids that would stick up um, from uh, the, the different nodes. So now that we understand what the temperature uh, within an element looks like, and it's made up of only three non-zero uh, interpolating functions, i, j, and k, uh, we can start to think about how to put together these area integrals in a, in a meaningful way. And the way we're going to do that is by splitting this area integral that happens over the entire computational domain into uh, a whole bunch of area integrals that are summed together, each one of which are happening over each element. So we're going to assemble our finite element problem element by element um, and then and then add those different uh, area integrals together, so those different matrices that we get out of this process together in order to get the global area integral over the entire computational domain.